Hello, my name is Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Modifying the Aerodynamics of Your Road Car. What I want to do in today's video is talk about designing ultra low drag vehicles. Now, this is the video to watch if you are interested in designing such a vehicle from scratch. You're not building on an existing shape, you're actually developing the shape with no starting point at all. Let's take a look. The first point to take on board is by far the lowest drag vehicles to ever travel on a public road are the solar race cars. They are far slipperier than any other vehicle that has ever been driven in the past. So take a look at this 1996 Honda Dream. Drag coefficient 0.101, 0.1. Frontal area 0.999 square meters. Total drag area 0.1. Just incredible. And to show you how incredible it is, that car took only six kilowatts to travel at 160 kilometers an hour, 100 miles an hour. So if we want to see how we can create the lowest drag vehicles, we really need to start off by looking at what the lowest drag vehicles that have ever existed have actually done. I want to take a look at six key areas. Now these are drawn from the speed of light. The book, the 1996 World Solar Challenge, and specifically chapter five by aerodynamicist Clive Humphreys. Six key areas, maintain attached flow, minimize wetted area, maximize laminar boundary layer, have zero lift, minimize frontal area, and minimize interference drag. We're gonna look briefly at each of those. So maintaining attached flow means we don't want the flow to separate. And these objects here have different drag coefficients, primarily because they have different separation characteristics. So the flow is going from left to right. When the air hits this flat plate, it spills untidily out around it. We have a lot of aerodynamic drag in the wake that is created behind it. Drag coefficient point, uh, sorry, 1.28. What about the prism? Again, Airflow hits this bluff face and spills out and doesn't actually flow around and reattach itself. Drag coefficient 1.14. Now, I'm not gonna get to all of them. Let's go straight to the airfoil. The air flows around each of the sides and then the streams come back together. So there's almost no wake behind an airfoil. And the drag coefficient 0.045. So you must use a streamlined shape where flow separation is minimized. The flow streams come back together, having followed the curve of the shape the whole way. What about this one? <clears throat> minimize wetted area. Now, wetted area is the area of the shape that is in contact with air. And it comes from the idea of a fluid, uh, like, like water, a streamlined body of a submarine. Uh, you can see all of its wetted area is all in contact with the fluid, isn't it? Now, if we want to minimize wetted area, we want to minimize protuberances such as that, because obviously that increases the wetted area. And we also can't go for an infinitely long shape. Remember, with the aerofoil, we wanted a long tail. But the longer the tail we create, the greater the wetted area, and therefore the greater the frictional drag. We don't talk much about frictional drag on normal car shapes, because nearly all of the drag is caused by separation and therefore pressure drag. But on ultra low drag shapes, frictional drag becomes important. And so we want to minimize wetted area while still retaining that attached flow. We want to maximize the laminar boundary layer. Now, when the air is following the shape of the car, we can say that there is a boundary layer condition existing. And when the air first starts to follow the shape, it's all just sliding over itself like packs of cards, like cards in a pack sliding past each other. But at some point, there's a little bit of uh, turbulence that develops in that boundary layer. Now the airflow is still attached, it's still following the car, but in a turbulent boundary layer form. And in normal cars, that's no bad thing, because a turbulent boundary layer will better follow the shape of the car, it separates less easily. But when we're talking about ultra low drag shapes, a turbulent boundary layer has more frictional drag than a laminar boundary layer. So we want that laminar boundary layer to continue as long as possible. How do we achieve that? We have very gentle curves on the forebody to accelerate the air, and we must maintain an excellent surface finish. 
because even something like a sticker on a car's body can trigger the uh, transition from a laminar to a turbulent boundary layer. So we want extreme smooth surfaces to allow that laminar boundary layer to last as long as possible. Excuse me, we want to have zero lift. Now, this is an interesting one. Here's a aerodynamic shape, a streamlined shape. Uh, and you can see it doesn't look much like a car. It has a drag coefficient of 0.04 and it has a coefficient of lift of zero. But when we put a shape near the road and we put a flat bottom on it, as we normally would on a car, we can see we've still got a nicely streamlined shape, but the drag coefficient has gone up to 0.15. Look how much higher that is than the Honda Dream but the coefficient of lift has also gone up enormously. And basically it's because of the big curve on the top surface compared with the bottom surface. We have higher speed flow across the top and therefore we have low pressure and lift. But the more lift we have, the more we have of what is called induced drag. And so lift causes drag, just as we're familiar with the idea that downforce causes drag of, a, of say a, a Formula One race car. So we need to shape both the top and the bottom surfaces in order to give as low a lift as possible. And that's something very important to keep in mind, not only from a point of view of low drag through reducing induced lift, but also, of course, from a point of view of actual driving stability on the road. We want to minimize frontal area. As you probably know, total drag is drag coefficient multiplied by projected frontal area. So if we can halve the projected frontal area, obviously we reduce the drag coefficient very, very substantially. And this interesting vehicle with two uh, bullet shaped pontoons joined together, uh, the driver sat in one, the engine was in the other. If you looked at it from the very front, you would see how little frontal area there was. So you really want to have as small a frontal area as possible. And in most vehicles, that just means making it as small as possible in width and height. And finally, we want to minimize what is called interference drag. Now, interference drag occurs when you have two different surfaces, like in this case, the wing and the fuselage of the aircraft, and they come to each other at right angles, and there's a sharp corner there. We want to smooth any of those transitions, and you can see this on any aircraft flying today. Transition smooth between the wing and the fuselage there, between the horizontal and vertical tail components where the engine joins the wing, the, the, the nacelle. We want to smooth all of those transitions, to blend all the surfaces with smooth curves. Now, there's a bunch of things there that we don't do typically when we're trying to reduce the drag of a normal road car, but here we're moving into a different field. We're moving into a field where boundary layers, uh, whether we're turbulent or where we have laminar boundary layers, does start making a big difference, where we want to have very smooth surfaces to reduce friction, and we want to minimize interference drag and induced drag. If you want to read more about those ideas, modifying the aerodynamics of your road car, the book's out now, available from Amazon. And if you want to test some of those ideas, car aerodynamic testing for road and track, available also as an electronic download, again from Amazon. Thank you.